everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sporting Directions, proudly sponsored by Tsunami Teamwear, with me, Gavin Taylor. And me, Simon Atkinson. For those of you new to the show, the Sporting Direction podcast is aimed at providing some ideas and guidance for those of you wanting to pursue a career in the world of sport. Over the first season, we'll be interviewing a range of different professionals in different areas of sport to share some of their amazing stories. We're we'll having them share with us some of their achievements, their struggles, and any advice for anybody listening wanting to pursue a career in sport. Today, we're really, really happy to welcome Dan Richardson. Now, Dan Richardson has set up his own consultancy company as a performance nutritionist. Dan has worked with several professional companies from a number of different sports and also creates a monthly information column for a nationwide sports paper. Dan has vast experiences in the world of sports nutrition, has a high quality master's degree and lectures in a university on this topic. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for having me both. Um, really good to uh, be on the podcast today. Super excited to hear about your story, Dan. Thanks so much for your time. So we're going to get straight into it, buddy. Um, first question is, what is a strong memory that led you to pursuing a career in sport? And how did that direction of your career take you to where you are today? Brilliant. So I think probably my strongest memory of what kind of led me down this route was, you know, my playing career in rugby. Um, so actually playing rugby and taking part in rugby actually led me to really get involved with the sport and the science and the, all the different sides and elements to um, obviously the career that I'm down today. And I think in terms of my career path, um, you know, I think it all started really back at school um, and that keen interest in GCSEP. Um, certainly didn't know what I wanted to do when I was doing GCSEP. It could have been anything from a PE teacher um, all the way through to obviously what I am now, like a sports nutritionist. I quite enjoyed the psychology and the physio side and wasn't too sure of uh, you know where to go from there. Um, and then that led me on to um, having a careers meeting with um, somebody from a college. Um, and we actually decided from there after finishing my GCSEs that a BTEC in sports science would be my best approach. I think that was mainly because, you know, um, I wanted to go and do sports science. I wanted to stay open minded to all the possibilities um, of a career I could have in sport as I knew I was never going to be a professional athlete by this point. Um, which then led me to realize that, you know, BTEC was the best option um, because, you know, the sports science was completely adaptable to the degree I was going to do. Um, and I remember trying to decide on my A-levels and, you know, I came up with, you know, like A-level PE, A-level human biology, but then the other two, I just couldn't quite fill or plug that gap. Nearly went down the route of studying some maths or English, but that wouldn't have been applicable to the degree that I was going to go and do. Um, and then that led me to go to Durham University. Um, and I think from there, that's when I really started to realise what I wanted to do with my career, um, especially doing sports science. I played for the uh, Durham Rugby League team whilst I was out there as well, um, captained the first team, which was a great honour and uh, a bit of an achievement for myself. Uh, by no means my greatest achievement. I think it was just an enjoyable time while I was at uni. Um, and then I think, you know, my career kind of has come to the point where it is today in terms of I went on and did the master's degree um, in Manchester, worked with a, uh, you know, a few professional teams and then ended up setting up uh, my own company from there. So I think in terms of my career, it's been quite um, you know, straight and narrow. I've just kind of followed a, a specific path, but there's certainly been bumps and you know, setbacks along the way um, as I've gone through this journey to where I am today. That's, that's a lot there, Dan. So thank you very, very much. It's great to hear that you've had a quite, quite extensive journey. I love the idea that you had a, a, a conversation with a careers counsellor, and I know a lot of people will have conversations with that. Um, I'm just curious, when you had that conversation, were you aware of, of lots of different uh, career paths in, in, in sport, or, or were you kind of uh, more directed to one in particular? Uh, where, where did you stand at the point of that conversation? Um, honestly, I just thought there was A-levels available. And the reason I went and had the meeting was to find out and fill the gap of my other two A-levels. Um, so I've obviously chosen the two that I wanted to do, had them wrote down on my application. And then before I knew it, I was I was struggling, you know, to come up with another A-level that would have, you know, kind of sufficed in terms of the career path I wanted to go down. And it was very difficult to choose because, of course, I could have gone and done, you know, psychology, which I, you know, really enjoyed the underpinnings of psychology. I was, you know, at one point contemplating doing a, a language um, in case I decided to go work abroad in the future. But nothing was really, you know, lighting that spark for me and, and getting me excited um, about my future career and potentially in sport. And then obviously once the sport and exercise science BTEC came up, 
Um, you know, it was something that just fit every single um, criteria that I was looking for in a in a course. And I think, you know, until I spoke to this careers officer, I never actually knew that was an option. And I never realized that was available over A-levels. Um, and, you know, it really set me up well. We did a small dissertation uh, during our, my time and doing that, which then set me up well for when I was at U. And in my third year, so three years later, I had a dissertation to do that was marked and graded towards my degree. I kind of had a bit of an underpinning of how to look at research um, and critically appraise research already, even at the age of 16 through to 18. Whereas, you know, some of the guys coming off the back of A-levels hadn't done anything like this. They just sat in exams, whereas I'd done loads of different coursework. I'd done loads of assignments and then also a few exams as well, um, some vivas and um, some presentation exams. So I think you know, it set me up really well in the end. And I actually, you know, thank the careers advisor for having that conversation with me um, because without it, I don't think I'd have gone on and progressed as well when I got to Durham University because it almost gave me a head start against those guys that were just doing A-levels. Yeah, thank you for that, Dan. I think you're absolutely right. It's very important to have conversations with people who maybe a little know a little bit more than we do. Uh, people will come at it from different perspectives. You said you, you know, you just were looking for for the next step really. And and, and to go to your careers advisor seemed to have really helped. And, and that's another reason why we're doing what, what we're doing with, with this podcast. Um, you spoke about um, how, how the BTEC and, and obviously there's, there's other things out there like the IBs, which I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard about international baccalaureates, uh, which are alternatives to A-levels. And it's great to hear that, that's kind of set you up for the next stage, maybe a little differently to those students doing A levels. So anyone listening to this, you know that there are other options out there, um, and there are other ways to to, to get where where you want to go. But um, moving on, what I really want to know is is what was your inspiration? What what was your light bulb moment that told you nutrition is the direction I want to go in? Yeah, so I think from a young age playing sport. I never really had any sort of, you know, even in even in academy levels when I was playing um, in a, you know, professional setup in an academy when I was younger, I, I never really had that, um, you know, the sports science given or delivered to us because I think quite often or not those roles weren't appreciated within a club or within an academy as they are now today. And I think that original inspiration really got me, you know, thinking outside the box. I was searching questions on Google and looking on thought forums for ways to eat better or ways to grow stronger or bigger, ways to play better at rugby. I was watching, you know, skills videos on YouTube. And I always had that inquisitive mind as a, as a younger lad, um, you know, going through school and college. Um, and then it wasn't until, you know, I got to university and I was like, there is so much opportunity here, you know, studying sports science to actually go down one of these avenues and explore it deeper in a master's. And I really, if I'm honest, didn't know until around third year um, at university. So in my final year at university, I started to look at jobs that are available, you know, coming out of uni, you want to go into a job, um, you know, that relates to the degree you've just spent three years working hard for. Um, and it turns out a lot of them, you needed a master's degree anyway. Um, and I was kind of a little bit almost shocked because I'd not really been told this. So I would kind of gone through the university degree, gone to apply for a job and realized there's still more learning to do. And then in third year, I really kind of, you know, sat down myself and had that light bulb moment of, you know, I've got the choice of going down the route of sports psychology, sports physio, or potentially as I, as I ended up doing sports nutrition. And I kind of had to ask myself, what was I really interested? In, you know, right from that early age of a younger child, what was my inspiration? And actually, a lot of the questions I had around sports and the sports science behind it was nutrition. I saw as well from the research that it was a growing space. You know, there wasn't that many nutritionists in every single club or in every single sport as there is today. And I think it's still a growing area and it's always changing. Um, and I quite like when I tell people that I'm a sports nutritionist and they always ask, how do I go through, you know, the minefield of information that's out there? And the thing is, even now, you know, as a professional in sports nutrition, I'm still learning. There's still new research coming out. And I think, you know, that's what really kind of sparked my interest originally was, you know, I'm never going to stop learning and I'm always going to be able to find something new um, within the sports nutrition world to uh, research or look up or actually deliver to, um, you know, my my clients that I work with today. I mean, that that's a great story as well, because I think everyone has those light bulb moments, those moments of clarity of, OK, I'm, I'm at a crossroads in my life now or I'm at a, it's, it, something happens to people, positives, negatives, and they go, OK, how am I going to change my career or my, my life pathway? Um, and obviously from your situation, it was in that inquisitive mind, that open-mindedness to, to, to do some research and have a look. What's really interesting about your story, just for those that are listening, and it kind of then relates to, to my question, Dan, is 
you know, you worked in, in a lot of different professional backgrounds. You worked with Warrington Wolves, you worked with South Sharks, Witness Vikings, Manchester City Football Club. You worked with the British Rowing uh, Society. Obviously, recently you've been working with, with Touch Rugby and the kind of the, the, the national setup and things. What's interesting when you use the word term growing industry as a sports nutritionist, and it is something that, as you said, it, it, it was not really heard of 10 years ago as such, maybe maybe even more recent than that. What, can you tell me a little bit about what you have seen in terms of the growth of that career path? So not necessarily naming names in terms of links and differences between that journey, but how have you seen that profession grow over the last say five or six years yeah so i think you know it's still got a lot of growing to do you know the sports nutrition industry i've always said that i believe it's still deemed in a few clubs and a few sports that your nutritionist and your psychologist aren't essential they're just that cherry on the top so they're just the kind of if they've got the money to fund it or if they've got the staff to bring somebody in like that they tend to whereas you know nowadays especially in football and rugby it's becoming ever more present that you know they need full-time nutritionists working within the sport whereas i think if you look back five six years ago you know being a nutritionist would be a part-time role and you'd probably pair that up with being a sports scientist um, or a data analyst or some other profession within sport you'd have to almost be multifaceted in the way that you um, deliver your services because you wouldn't have a full-time nutritionist in there um, and I think you know myself obviously when I started out a lot of the roles I did were part-time or there were placements or contracts that I'd work within because again the clubs don't have the funding or didn't have the funding um, and didn't see the the value in having a sports nutritionist full-time within the club I think nowadays with all of the research that's out there and, you know, all of the different elements to nutrition, such as, you know, the actual diet, the energy balance, um, you know, checking play, players' body composition. So, you know, doing all of the um, analysis and the tests on the players, checking that they're eating enough energy to, you know, compensate for their energy expenditure um, and doing all of the different science sides of the nutrition world now has really made it a full-time career and job. And I think, you know, it doesn't limit you to just telling a player that he needs to eat more protein. There's so much more science behind it in terms of hydration, sleep, well-being. Um, you know, and some clubs have had to help manage stress levels with a psychologist using certain foods as triggers. And obviously, you know, that nutrition psychology comes into play as well, especially when you're working with, you know, professional athletes who have pretty much been there and done that all their lives. And then suddenly I walk in as a nutritionist and tell them they need to change how they're eating because you know they've they've realized that they're eating wrong but what tends to happen is that information potentially is misinformation from you know strength and conditioning coaches that have tried to play the role of nutritionist five years ago when actually they needed somebody that was a specialist in that area not somebody who's just had a quick skim over the research or read an online article of rugby players need x amount of protein or whatever it might be so i think in terms of how it's changed you know we're much more, I think, respected, but I still think we have that um, almost, I almost say, with the devil of the club because we come in and tell the players that they need to change, whereas strength and conditioning coaches tell the players they need to grow or they need to develop, and it's more fun to lift weights in the gym, but it's not fun when you find out you can't have, you know, your pizza on a Friday night because it'll affect your game on the Saturday. Um, so I, I think it's certainly still changing to this day now as well. I think, you know, it's certainly growing um, and it's certainly changing a lot in terms of, the role within the clubs becoming more and more important each day and each year. I was just having a little chuckle there when you said the difference between change and grow and you being the guys, the, the devils have been out to not let them eat what they like or, or whatever. But no, it's a, it's a really interesting concept that. And what as, as, as sports people, obviously myself and then Simon hosting, we, we don't know anywhere near as much detail that you're going into, which is fascinating. But yeah, it, it's interesting to see, like you said, a, a, a role such as yours that has grown in importance over such a small space of time. And and now when you look at the professional teams, you, if they don't have a sports nutritionist, then you're kind of looking at as to why. But like you said, there's still perhaps some some catching up to do in certain areas or sports or, yeah. or teams or whatever. Um, I know as well as part of your, you, you obviously we said at the start, you've got your own company. Um, yeah. And I know that you also work within schools uh, and you work in, in with school teams and supporting that as well. So I kind of want to dig into that a little bit and find out what your greatest ever achievement is and link that into is it is it a personal goal in terms of you know achieving be able to create your own your own boss and create your own company which is wonderful is it based around a, a club that you've worked with people the ones you've mentioned or a particular situation you're in now is it to be able to pass that knowledge on to schools uh, and obviously have a wider impact uh, from a school setting 
So yeah, just tell us. I mean, you can answer all of the above. It might be one of one of three, or it might be four, or but let us just know a little bit about you know what what's what's the real thing that's made you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of that. That's something that's I'm really happy about in terms of the way my career's gone. Yeah. So I think you know one thing I I kind of have to remind myself quite often is you know there's so much opportunity in sport, especially if you're working in sport, and it, you're not limited to going in and working just at one club. Um, and not only that, you're not limited to a specific set of athletes either. So I used to always think, you know, I'm going to be the best rugby nutritionist there is around and I'm going to know all the information on rugby nutrition. But then you realize that those skills are transferable to, you know, different professional athletes and different amateur athletes. And I think, you know, if, if you know, guys listen to this and wanting to go into a career in sport, I think one of the biggest bits of advice I can give you is actually don't limit yourself to a certain audience. Um, and that's something I found when I set up my own company. And I think, you know, I'm, I'd still yet to think I've hit my greatest achievement yet. I'm hoping that, you know, the company will serve a purpose as my greatest achievement. Um, and it's something that I can, you know, fall back on and be proud of. But I think in terms of my greatest achievement at the moment was probably landing the um, head of nutrition role at Warrington Wolves. So when I actually went from just being a nutritionist to then managing the nutrition um, at a club. So you kind of take a little bit of a step back from the performance nutrition element in terms of delivery. Um, and you actually, you know, assist with the general ongoings of the day. So I used to get to plan out the calendar and the nutrition calendar, what would be delivered, um, you know, how we do things. Whereas we'd have, you know, I'd be the one that would say, right, we're going to have, you know, morning shakes um, filled with X, Y, and Z supplements. We're going to have, you know, the pill pots out in the morning with all the different vitamins and minerals uh, that the players might require. And then obviously food as well. I got to choose meal timings based on training and it was more logistics of working with, you know, different people in different departments to make sure that everything ran smoothly for myself and the other nutritionists that were involved. But yeah, certainly with my company, that kind of came out um, a little bit of a, I want to say a fluke almost, but again, just trying new things and trying different um, areas of um, expertise and seeing what you're, you're capable of. You know, I never thought I'd be able to run a business. I always thought I'd work with a company or a school or a, a club or whatever it might be delivering sports nutrition. Um, and it wasn't until probably around between a, two of the lockdowns that we had um, between COVID where one of my friends who worked in a school said, oh, we'd love you actually, if you've got a bit of time available now, you know, professional sports stopped. We'd love it if you could come and just deliver um, an individual talk. And from there, I just loved the questions that I got. And I couldn't believe how limited the knowledge was of, you know, these guys at school that potentially could become sports stars in the future. You know, there was a few guys that were on the books of some academies. There was a few guys that were playing really high level football. Um, but then nutrition knowledge was so limited um, and that kind of led me to ask a question. And then obviously my, my company hoping to answer that question was, you know, what is the current situation in terms of sports nutrition knowledge uh, taking away social media um, and things they read on Facebook and online, et cetera. Um, and actually what do they know from a research perspective and how different is their knowledge compared to the professionals? And it was actually quite shocking to realize that, you know, the the kind of the, the knowledge and sports nutrition knowledge of students was very, very limited. Um, so from there, I started working with um, a few schools just to kind of um, get involved with the school's um, sector. Um, and what we do is I go in and I deliver a, a package. So I know from working you know, as a head of nutrition that you can't just go in and deliver one session and expect it to stick. It's a case of that a pro program is what's going to bring everything to life. Um, and, you know, sharing that knowledge over a period of time is what's kind of brought it to life. So for me, I'd go in and maybe deliver, you know, a, a, so in between like a four or 16 week program. Um, and they include, you know, multiple different things such as cooking sessions, Q and A sessions, parents and staff sessions to make sure everybody's, you know, on the same page. And then also those education sessions, but, you know, this is where I had to learn because, you know, with a rugby player, you can tell them it in black and white. And you can kind of say to a rugby player, this is what you've got to do now, go and do it. Whereas if you tell a student that, you know, and I know there'll probably be a few students listening here. If I said, you have to eat this or eat that, you may take that the wrong way. You may take that a little bit extreme, or you may just go in one ear and out the other. So it was actually, for me, it was finding that engagement and, you know, not coming from a teaching background, learning from some of the directors of sports I've worked with of how to make a session engaging and how to actually produce a good program. Um, and then again, you know, that that kind of led me to the company. And I think probably my greatest achievement so far um, is, you know, working with the schools that I've already worked with um, and then also doing a few online um, sessions with some schools um, abroad as well. So we've done some online cooking workshops, online lectures and educations through, you know, the power of Zoom and Teams and whatever else schools use. 
Um, I think it's just brilliant that I'm able to reach so many different people, um, I, you know, across an array of sports, you know, in, in one sitting, I can have a hundred different student athletes um, in a room or on online on Zoom that are just listening to me talk about nutrition, but everything I say is applicable to their sport or whatever discipline looking to do and I think just sharing that knowledge is such a you know a, an intrinsic feel-good motive towards my business and that's one of the main reasons you know I love what I do but I think it's always important to remember that you know if you're not happy or satisfied in the role that you're currently doing similarly to what I was there is other opportunities and there is so many different opportunities out there uh, um, you know such as working for yourself or working within different you know industries as a sports nutritionist or a nutritionist. Well, that, that's, that's absolutely captivating. Uh, I've written an awful lot down there, Dan, so thank you ever so much. Um, I think the key things I wrote down were things, some quotes I'm going to take from you. Uh, and I'm yeah. definitely going to be using them myself. <laughs> Don't limit yourself. I love that one. I absolutely love that one. Don't limit yourself, no matter at what stage you are in your learning or in your career. Don't box yourself in. Don't limit yourself. I do love that one. Um, very similar to you. I did a sports science degree to keep my options open. Um, my, my passion was biomechanics um, and, and that kind of led to, to, to where I, I moved on eventually. I like the idea of take the risk, take the opportunity, maybe a, a better way of saying it. Uh, you were presented yeah. with an opportunity to kind of uh, do some work in schools and and, it, and you can see from, from what you've just spoken there how passionate you are about what it is you do and and when you started talking about the schools it was, it was great to see your eyes light up and, and see yeah. that that kind of detail and depth go in and, and, and you know as an educator myself it's great bringing people like yourself in because it's not necessarily what you say and how you it, it's more about how you say it and and the passion that you you bring to the room the children will feed off that and, and, and take it forward. And, and hopefully they, they will take it on board and, and not end up at McDonald's later on that evening um, and, and actually listening to what it is you have to say with them. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to look at Gavin's question again, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of ask the opposite of it. Uh, yeah. We've heard about some fantastic achievements um, and some fantastic accomplishments, but what I'm curious about is, has there been any barriers? Has there been any setbacks? And, and if so... How have they helped you move forward? Certainly. I think, you know, there's there's never a good su success story without the setback. So I think they make you stronger. Um, and I think I've always tried to take them on the chin, so to speak. I think it's a very old-fashioned way that my dad's probably brought me up with, of, you know, take that one on the chin, son, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and go again. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, I always say there's no... Um, there's no stupid question to be asked. You know, you can always, you know, connect and talk with everybody. And if you get a no, it's just a no. But those no's can actually be, you know, quite detrimental sometimes and a bit of a setback. I think possibly one of my biggest setbacks comes from playing sport. And I kind of up to the age of, you know, 18, I, I kind of thought oh, I'm really going to pursue becoming a professional rugby player. And I really wanted to, even if it was semi-professional whilst working part time in sport, I think it's really important, you know, that, I, I give it a good shot. Then I remember getting to 18 and I sat down um, just as I was finishing college with the club that I was playing for, won't name the club. And they said, look, you've got an option here. You can stay with our academy um, and our scholarship program and you can work your way up into the first team or you can go to Durham University, but you can't do both. I remember saying to him, look, I'm going to be playing high level rugby. I'm hoping to be playing for the first the first team at Durham and I'm really hoping that I can you know kick on in my career I'll put you in touch with my coaches and I'll come back and I'll play during the summers the Christmases I'll do extra training I'll do whatever it is that it takes and in other words you know the ultimatum was you stay in you stay here or you go you go off to university and I think you know it was it was a tough and long decision that I spoke with my parents about I spoke with some friends about who actually played for the same club as me I said look this is what I've just been told do I do I stay and pursue this um, and I remember it was a conversation I had with my dad and he said, look, you can always go back to playing, you know, professional rugby. You're going to be playing at high level at Durham. If it doesn't, if it does work out, you will end up being picked up somewhere along the line. If it doesn't, you at least you've got a career to go on to. Um, and I think that was probably one of the most meaningful conversations I had uh, with my dad at the time, because it was one of those where, you know, without that conversation, I probably would have stayed, um, you know, back home trying to play rugby and wouldn't have had, you know, a career in sport at all. I probably would have been doing something else. Not too sure what it would have been um, because, you know, I really put everything into sport. But I think that passion from, you know, playing sport then just translated directly into working in sport and, and wanting to do well in sport and work with athletes. 
Um, I think some of my setbacks come from, you know, probably the job opportunities I've missed out on and, you know, some of the interviews that I've done, especially when I was younger, um, trying to, you know, find and pave my way in sports nutrition um, and just knowing coming out of that interview that I didn't give it my best. And, you know, you get home late that evening um, after you finished a full day of interviewing and you start thinking of the the, the answers you could have given to the questions and the ones that you didn't um, and the ones that you froze up on. But actually, um, you know, it's all a learning curve. And I think that's what one thing I tried to take away from that is, you know, from the hundreds of interviews and applications I probably did, um, you know, from the, you know, the few jobs that I've worked with and the few clubs I've worked with, without those failed interviews and those failed applications and those kind of barriers um, that I came across, I wouldn't have interviewed so well in the jobs that I'd actually got. Um, so I think, you know, there isn't there isn't just negatives to take away from the barriers. I think there's a lot of positives to take away from barriers and, you know, failures um, in your career because failures is what makes the successes at the end of the day. And I think that's something, you know, for the young listeners on here that are thinking, you know, I could never get to a position of, you know, working for yourself. I was the same as you when I was, you know, 15, 16, if not younger, never even considered the fact that I'd be working, you know, for my own company. Um, and actually now looking back at it, you know, I wish I could tell 15, 16 year old Dan, like, just go for it. They just go for every opportunity, grab it with two hands. If it doesn't work, you know, it's going to be a learning curve and you're going to learn from that. I think they're saying something like, um, you know, shoot for the moon. And if you don't, you'll land amongst the stars or whatever it is, you know, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a silly quote to some, but actually it's very true. And it speaks volumes in, you know, most people's careers that have had a little bit of success. No, that's some fantastic advice there, Dan. Thank you very much. And something that really came out of that was that idea of growth mindset, you know, um, wanting to always move forward, always wanting to learn more, always wanting to push further. And, and I think that's really, really important uh, for, for anyone wanting to move forward in their life. And I, I do like that idea and, and something that uh, I think we're very similar. Our dads tend to be the ones that give us the advice that we, we listen to, whether yeah. it's right advice or wrong advice, but our dads... Uh, <laughs> Uh, definitely the ones we listen to. And um, I like that idea that's coming out that it, it's not failure, it's experience. So if we, yeah. if, we, if we don't get an interview, if we don't get a job, it's not failure, it, it's experience. We, we learn from it and we move forward. And I think that's definitely key for anyone that's listening. If you do make a mistake, if you do fail, if you do slip up, it, it's not failure, it, it's experience. Um, only if you make it experience. And, and, and what I mean by that is by learning from your mistakes and moving forward. And, and it, it, it's good to hear that, you know, even people like yourself who've achieved some amazing things, they went through that period of experience or failure, however you want to see it. And I think that's really important for people, people to hear. The, the question I want to now move on to is more down the businessman than Dan, the, the sports and nutritionist fan, fanatic. And, and something we haven't had before on, on this show is someone who's really established their own uh, their own business uh, and seen it grow and develop. Um, and what I want to ask is, how did you do that? How, how did you get this business up and running and how are you growing it and moving it forward? So very good, you know, surround yourself with the right kind of people, I think is the first thing. You know, I've got some good family friends who probably being a bit, um, you know, neglecting in terms of me contacting them and staying in touch with them you know parents family friends who own businesses um you know i didn't have a clue where to start when i first started i remember sat, sitting down and making my logo and i thought that was the first thing i needed to do was a good logo and a name where actually you need a bit of a mission and a bit of a you know mission statement of what you want to achieve you know and i think the the main thing i did was just sat there for probably the best part of a month um in one of the lockdowns and every day just ask myself why do i want to do this so before I did anything, I mean, I had the logo and the name and I had, you know, the fancy Instagram ready to go and the, the fancy LinkedIn page ready to launch when I wanted it. But it was, you know, why, why am I doing this? Because I think quite often or not, if you try to start up a business without a purpose or a direction, um, you know, you're just going to end up lost or taking on too much or trying not you know trying to diversify too much. So I think, you know, quite simply put, um, you know, I just wanted to be a a person myself and then obviously the business as well being somebody who's a good sounding board for you know sports nutrition so ensuring that you know we practice what we preach you know in terms of a food first approach that's backed by science and also stays on top 
top of the um, the research and what's coming out in terms of the papers and delivering that you know that complete athlete experience so you know not just going down the route of here's a diet plan that's going to help you to perform better at rugby actually teaching habits and educational um you know nutrition to athletes so they can take it away and use it for later life as well they can pass it on to kids if they're you know an elder athlete or you know their kids can learn from it as well so you know i work with various athletes from you know I, I was on you know a call the other day with some parents and their 13 year old son who's a footballer and you know they wanted him to have you know a better understanding of nutrition and why it's important and you know what the parents are doing for this child and actually how to help him grow and develop and perform not just as a sport and athlete but as a healthy individual as well you know and I think on the other side I've got you know 50 year old athletes who are retired from professional sport but still taking part in, you know, um, you know, different types of events like cross country running, tennis, cricket, things like that. And they want to know how to keep their nutrition up and running whilst, you know, they've finished their professional playing career and they want to continue to develop and, and grow as well with their nutrition. And, you know, those kind of guys tend to have a bit more of an understanding of what nutrition was like when they played and actually how it's changed now. Uh, but I think, yeah, businessman, Dan, I try not to uh, go into business mode too much, but I think, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that you you don't really expect, you know, especially when you're coming out of a full-time job where everything's done for you, but it's stuff like, you know, finding an accountant, you know, learning how to do your taxes, uh, admin, you know, dealing with emails, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things and realms that go on within a business that, you know, aren't related to sport at all, but I think there's certainly you know, some practices you can take from that. You know, I studied business studies at school and even those little things that I picked up in business studies from a GCSE point of view, I still utilize some of the knowledge that I've learned today. Um, you know, there's there's not a single subject I wouldn't say that isn't, you know, greatly important than the others, especially in GCSE level and when you're still at school, because everything I've learned from school and that background, I've managed to apply bits and pieces from each subject. And I think, you know, that's the thing when it comes to business, you've got to be kind of, you've got to be able to wear, you know, 20 hats in one day. I can go from performance nutritionist, which I must say is my favorite hat to wear, um, working with athletes, working with clients, but then I've got to go down the route of social media manager of doing the posts on the Instagram and the LinkedIn, um, you know, responding to people's message requests. I've then got to go down the route of business down where I have to deal with the accountant and the finances of the business to make sure that, you know, we're still making some profit somewhere. Um, and then I've got to go down the charitable side where I'll do some talks for free um, or I'll be going down and speak at an event, for example, that'll be unpaid. And I think, you know, it's it's such a diverse job role, um, you know, managing your own company. But you've got to remember where your heart's at and why you started it, I think. Because some days, you know, they're hard, you know, you'll have 20 odd emails to respond to. You'll have three diet plans or nutrition plans to write up plus a talk. And they're the big days that, you know, you, you look forward to. But on paper, when you're doing them, there can be a long slog of a day. Um, but you've got to remind yourself why you started and, you know, why you're here and the way you've got here. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway point of from businessman, Dan, as we can call him, is actually just remember why you started and remember where that passion grew from, especially on those harder days. Just uh, going to be a tiny bit selfish there, Dan, and, talk, and uh, just link back to myself. So when I, uh, during lockdown, I taught my students online to juggle. And I must admit, oh, yeah. listening to your story there, it literally sounds like that's what you're doing as a businessman, Dan. You're juggling 15 <laughs> different balls in the air and spinning a thousand plates. Um, really like the kind of the different hats approach and stuff. But yeah, again, I think the powerful message from that is always go back to your why. Um, you know, what's what's the why? Uh, and there's a lots of, obviously, as I know Simon Sinek's got a really good book, Start With Why, and there's a couple of others out there that, you know, go back to. But I think that's a really powerful message that you've sent there is, Always go back to the why. Um, so obviously you spoke a little bit about your business, um, which is really interesting. And, and what we'll do for those listening is we'll we'll link um, Dan's business page to the to the bio, so you can have a look. And obviously, if you want to have um, some expertise, help from Dan, you're more than welcome. Dan, I just kind of want to speak speak a little bit about what's next. So you talked a bit about your mission statement. You talked about your why. What's next for you well, and they, your company, businessman Dan? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I've got a new title now, haven't I? That's it. No, I think. <laughs> What's next is just, you know, I'm, I'm all about growth and development and just being the best version of myself, you know, where possible. Um, and I just want to see where this business takes me. You know, I'm, I'm really enjoying the side of working in schools um, and delivering packages alongside, you know, strength and conditioning coaches in schools, directors of sport. And I think there's a real gap in the market to have a sports nutritionist 
um, you know, that comes from a different background of what potentially the catering companies come from um, and deliver something that's a little bit more, um, you know, sports professionalism um, and looking around, you know, that elite development of a student athlete. And I think, you know, doing what I currently do with the professional athletes and, you know, with England Touch is great. And I really enjoy working with, you know, the top, top level athletes. Um, but I do want to take on more, you know, schools and, um, you know, work with some more schools in terms of developing their sports nutrition knowledge and hopefully you know those athletes that learn at school can then go on and play professional sport um you know after school as well so i think in terms of you know where's next i think work with a lot a lot more athletes and you know try to reach as many piece, people as possible in whatever capacity that be whether that be one-to-ones you know large-scale talks or working with certain clubs and teams like england touch um i think you know is where i really want to go and just really grow and develop myself as a nutritionist you know, continually learning and then also grow the business um, at the same time and try to hopefully, um, you know, create something quite special, um, you know, from DRN Nutrition. Well, Dan, hopefully um, you taking the time out and uh, being a part of our podcast here will hopefully help at least reach some listeners and some people that you can have an influence on because your story is is really powerful and, and I'm hoping those that have listened to it have found it as, as fascinating as I have. Uh, I've just wrote down here, it'd be quite interesting to think that maybe – uh, in the future, we we should be looking at hiring sports nutritionists as, as, as teaching staff within PE departments, perhaps, um, like you said, to deliver the importance of sports nutrition um, because it seems to be a growing, like you said, you talked about it being a growing uh, career uh, and the fact that you're trying to target younger students as well. So it, it's also starting to become quite important, certainly if you're having parents reaching out, uh, you know, you talked about a, a 13-year-old boy there. So um, we always like to finish the, the podcast with a couple of fun questions uh, Dan, and, and like I said, it's been a fascinating story that you've, you've told us. I'm really happy that you've taken the time out to meet with us. I always like to finish off mine with uh, a bit of a question. You've given out quite a few. I've written a few down. Setbacks make you stronger. Failure is what makes your success. I could go on, but I'd love, I don't want to <laughs> steal your thunder. Uh, but my question is, what's your mantra, Dan? What's the one sentence or saying that you feel that you live your life by? I think, you know, not so much a, a mantra, and it's a bit of a, possibly a, a bit of a, a gimmicky thing that I think a lot of teachers say as well when they ask whether there's a question, and I do it all the time in my talks, but I try to live my life by this as well as, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question, or there's no such thing as a silly question, you know, no matter whatever you're going to ask, you know, as a question, if you don't get a response, then, you know, that's what is what it is but if you get a response it could lead somewhere and I think my life's been you know I like to say a lot of happy coincidences you know from asking the, the right questions to the right kind of people um, and actually asking the right questions and then getting no response from some people as well and I think you know just reminding yourself that you know if you've got a question to ask ask it because you know you never know where it might lead you. You know I like that one a lot just keep asking questions there's always people who know more than you and uh, if you can share in that knowledge it'll take us a, a lot further than where we are now that's that's fantastic um i have a, a little fun question i do like to ask um it sometimes gets the brain going uh my question would be if you weren't in nutrition if you weren't in the role you're in now what else do you think you would be doing very good question <laughs> i've never actually thought about this um i think as a young lad, I, I wanted to be either an electrician or a uh, or a pilot, but then I realised I was colour blind. So if we could go back and uh, and get rid of the colour blindness, I think possibly a pilot or electrician. But that's a bit of a cop out of an answer. Um, so I try to think. I think I'd probably still be within the sports industry. I think I enjoy sport and the challenges it brings too much to actually let go of the sport and industry. I've always said I wish I'd had a little bit of background in sports psychology because that would really press on and help me with you know delivering sports nutrition to understand an athlete's brain so I think probably a sports psychologist as much as I'm not trained as a sports psychologist I think certainly another discipline that's you know growing um similar to sports nutrition um at quite a rapid rate as well in clubs and professional athletes I think yeah probably a sports psychologist but if I wasn't colorblind certainly a, a pilot or a uh, or an electrician yeah, I mean that's 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 a great answer, but it's it's also great to hear that you know your roots are so deep into sport you can't really see uh, any way out of it. Moving from nutrition into psychology, and as you say, those two factors are, are growing hugely uh, in, in the modern world. And and you know, I, let me echo um, Gavin's sentiments I, as a, a you know a director of sport and athletic director. 
I would think I can very much see schools very soon starting to employ sports psychologists, sports nutritionists, because as, as we've discovered, it's a very, very important part of building those lifelong habits moving forward. You know, we, we know about the obesity problem, um, you know, which is covering a lot, a lot of countries and um, we've changed the way we approach PE and the way we approach sport to try and in, increase activity levels but maybe we've not put as much emphasis on to what it is children, young adults, even adults are putting into their body, um, which is one of the main causes of obesity. So it would be interesting to see what would happen if we could uh, start bringing in uh, sports nutritionists into, into PE departments and, and see what the effect that has on uh, in obesity and, and, and health levels generally across, across the country and across the world. Um, I just want to finish by saying thank you so much for your time, Dan. It's been great talking to you. I've picked up lots and lots of uh, golden nuggets, which uh, I'm going to be using. And uh, the next meeting I have with my principal will be, can, can I have a sports nutritionist, please, on the team? So, uh, <laughs> from, from, from me and Gavin, thank you ever so much for your time. No, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to listen to me ramble on in my Yorkshire accent about, you know, my career. But I just think... You know, if there's anyone out there listening who's, you know, maybe that young 16, 17 year old, um, you know, student that's looking towards a career in sport and needs a little bit more information. You know, we've got an Instagram page that you can happily reach out to, which is literally just DRN Nutrition um, or on our website. We've got a contact area um, or on LinkedIn. If you're already on LinkedIn as well at that age, I think, you know, I think ask those questions now. Um, because you know something that might take you three years to learn somebody might be able to answer it in 30 seconds on a question um, and like I always say there's no such thing as a stupid question and then any kind of you know school departments or directors of sports that are looking towards utilizing you know some form of sports nutritionist um, or service like that we offer an array of different packages from you know online in person talks and packages and things like that um, you know, I always say there's no two packages that are the same with schools because every school's different. So even if it's just to reach out and, you know, ask me, you know, a couple of questions around sports nutrition, more than happy to help anybody who's listening to this that wants a little bit of support or advice with their nutrition or their career path. Amazing, Dan. Thanks for that. I'm pretty sure that there'll be lots of people contacting you, certainly from a heads of PE point of view, trying to get you in and uh, tap into your expertise, mate. So again, huge thanks for your time and, and, and sharing us your story. We hope all the listeners have enjoyed it. And from all of us at the Sporting Direction team, have a lovely day and we look forward to seeing you in our next episode.